Hello everybody out there, this is David Brish from APS Online, a counselor and psychology teacher, and uh, we're going to talk about schizophrenia, and uh, we're going to mention some other psychotic disorders, but we're going to kind of focus on schizophrenia today as a, an example of a psychotic disorder, because um, A, it's interesting, and B, it's one of the, uh, I don't know, like more famously common diagnosed disorders, so I figured we would focus on schizophrenia today. You can see over here in the right hand side of our screen our essential question. We've been talking about abnormal behavior for a couple of weeks now and this time we're focusing on schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders. So we're trying to figure out what is abnormal behavior, right? Well let's dive in and see. So what does psychotic mean? I figured we'd take a look at this first before we um, you know, start digging into any specifics. And psychotic, or psychosis, you often hear that term as well. It's the same thing. Um, it means essentially that a person cannot distinguish between what is real and what is not real. And so what the most common features you'll see are delusions and hallucinations. Another common one is disorganized speech. One of those three has to be present, at least, in order for it to qualify as, you know, most of these disorders. And so what does it mean that a person can't distinguish between reality and fantasy? What does it mean when we say that the, the client just <clears throat> isn't living within our reality? What it means is the person is having, well, delusions are common. The person's having delusions. and these are persistent beliefs that occur no matter what kind of evidence is presented uh, to refute the belief. They come in a bunch of different kind of flavors, but for the most part, they're beliefs that are quite often paranoid or, um, you know, in some ways very different from what you would consider to be, um, you know, what a, what a normal person would think in the same situation. You know, so you're presented with um, uh, the same evidence. You know, um, there's a new car in the neighborhood, right? And somebody who's not suffering from delusions can explain away the car in a number of different ways, right? Oh, it's somebody who's coming to look at new houses. It's somebody who has moved in across the street. It's someone who um, is over for a party at a friend's house. It's someone that um, is picking up somebody else uh, for a carpool, those sorts of things, right? Somebody with a delusion is going to take that information though and fit it into a narrative that they have already constructed. So even if the person gets out of the car, walks up to the person, introduces themselves, hey, you know, I'm Steve and I'm, uh, I'm just here because I'm uh, new in town and we're trying to find a house, my wife and I, and, you know, we're just kind of cruising neighborhoods to see kind of what it's like. A person that has a delusion, especially a persecution, is going to think that, hmm, that's odd. I'm going to be suspicious of that guy. I think that that person is really there following me. So the different flavors of delusions are persecution, which kind of like I just talked about. Every, every uh little event and piece of evidence that occurred during the day are all tied together into some sort of narrative that is, you know, the world is out to get me. That's persecution. And there's grandiose delusions in which people think that they are, um, you know, like more important celebrity, uh, famous people than they, you know, are in real life. So. These people might believe that they are a celebrity or a president or a you know a wealthy CEO, something like that. And then we have an erotomaniac delusion, which is about um, someone famous or being in love with someone famous and uh, believing that that other person is also in love with you. So. Um, you know, that's, that's happened a couple times, uh, relatively recently, I can't, you know, it usually ends up 
um, in the news when somebody ends up breaking into a celebrity's house because, you know, he or she believes that the celebrity really loves him or her. Um, and so it can lead to some, you know, some scary situations for the celebrity, you know, because they obviously don't feel safe. And, and the person who's having the delusion believes that the celebrity really does love him or her and he or she is returning that love to the celebrity. And so, you know, it's kind of a scary delusion for the celebrity, obviously. Then there's nihilistic delusion. And nihilistic um, means that uh, a person believes that part of reality or part of themselves are, is gone or destroyed. You can see how obviously that might create problems for somebody who has that delusion. And then, then there's somatic delusion. And somatic delusions are about um, thinking a, a part of your body is broken or diseased or decaying. So despite any belief that you are able to marshal against these particular uh, delusions, you know, the person basically tries to fit whatever happens in his or her life into that delusion. So it's a very kind of self-fulfilling, cyclical process. And another um, feature of um, psychotic disorders are hallucinations. It can uh, hallucination can be any of the five senses, 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 any of the five senses. Although visual and auditory hallucinations are by far the most common. So you know, seeing things, hearing things, are by far the most common. But you know, you can you can uh, Phantomly smell things. You can phantomly uh, feel that something is on your skin. You know, everybody's everybody. I'm sure has in their mind an idea of what a hallucination is. Right. And the reason why is because you know psychotic um, disorders are pretty prominently featured in. Uh, quite a few films and popular media and the reason is because you know they're interesting and and strange and you know a lot of people um, feel that they're frightening you know so they're a lot of bad guys have delusions or hallucinations or you know what I mean so that's where you see them quite often okay so let's talk about some psychotic disorders there are brief psychotic disorder. That's a diagnosis that um, they can give. And obviously, it's brief, so the time frame is really compressed. There's schizophrenia spectrum disorder. It used to just be schizophrenia. But now, in the new DSM, the DSM-5, they've added schizophrenia spectrum. So um, kind of like autism, where there's a spectrum of um, severity of the illness. Um, the same thing is going for schizophrenia now. If you're on the schizophrenia spectrum, if you have schizophrenia. And then there's uh, schizoaffective disorder, which has many of the same diagnostic features as schizophrenia, but schizoaffective is in a shorter duration. We're talking within a month rather than over the course of six months. And then there's substance or medication induced psychotic disorders. So you know, there are many substances that one could take, uh, a lot of medications that one could take that um, could induce hallucinations and delusions and some of those psychotic uh, symptoms and disorder speech and stuff like that. So those are the ones we're going to talk about. And I thought that we would focus mostly on schizophrenia because, you know, it's um, probably the most famous one of these kind of disorders. So I figured that would be a good place to start. So there have been a number of famous people who have been diagnosed with schizophrenia or similar illness. You know, bipolar illness or bipolar disorder sort of um, has a lot of the same features as schizophrenia. So some of these people, um, like uh, like First Lady Lincoln here, um, could have been bipolar rather than schizophrenic. It's kind of hard to tell in the historical record, but <clears throat> but Mary Todd Lincoln, First Lady to Abraham Lincoln. Um, she suffered from uh, 
manic episodes, some called it, some called it uh, delusions, you know, it was kind of um, sort of left up to historians to decide, and historians obviously aren't psychologists, so a lot of them um, labeled it bipolar, some of them labeled it schizophrenia, so it's kind of, we're unsure as to what exactly it was. She was never diagnosed with anything. Um, then there was Vincent van Gogh. He's very famous, right, for cutting off the ear. Everybody knows about Vincent van Gogh, I think. Then there's Edward Einstein, son of Albert. He had schizophrenia. I don't know if you knew that. There's Philip K. Dick. He's a very famous science fiction author. Of uh, You might have seen some of these movies or read some of his books. Blade Runner, Minority Report, Total Recall, Scanner Darkly. He actually writes in a scanner darkly about someone with schizophrenia, someone that you could argue would have schizophrenia. It's either he has schizophrenia or, um, or the government is out to get him, right? Like, you're never really sure exactly which. Um, but the, the question of the story, you know, when you're, when you're listening to the narrator is, do you trust the narrator, you know? Because if he really does have schizophrenia, and he really is experiencing delusions and hallucinations, how can you tell that he knows what's really happening and what's not really happening? And so, you know, Philip K. Dick took a lot of his uh, experiences with dealing with schizophrenia and put them in the story there. Um, he also wrote a book called Valus, which is partly autobiographical. And in it, he talks, one of the, the, the main character, he talks about... Um, having delusions and hallucinations and, you know, whether or not reality is, is real or just our perception. Pretty interesting. And there's Brian Wilson, musician most famous for the Beach Boys. That's about schizophrenia. So there's quite a few people who have dealt with schizophrenia, or, or maybe bipolar, throughout the course of their lives and, you know, ended up being famous even though, I mean, a lot of these uh, uh, first group of famous people with schizophrenia, um, you know, they, they didn't have uh, some of the treatments that we have now for schizophrenia, so they, and they just had to deal with the, with the lack of reality testing on their own. <clears throat> so let's talk about the disorder itself, schizophrenia here. And here are the diagnostic criteria for it. I put a little box around this part. Because, um, you know, this is similar to uh, schizoaffective. We're going to have a shorter duration, though. So instead of lasting for six months, it's going to be lasting for one month. So an initial diagnosis, if you see a client who's only been experiencing, say, he's 17, a lot of uh, this disorder starts appearing in your teen years, you know, as you are um, sort of ending puberty. So for women, it might be a little earlier than that, but um, if the person is exhibiting these symptoms and it's only been a month because the person's 17, 18, something like that, then, you know, the, the, the mental health professional might diagnose the person with schizoaffective disorder because it hasn't lasted as long. But here are all the symptoms that need to happen in order for us to diagnose this. So, you need two or more of the following for a significant portion of time during a one-month period. So in that space of a month, two or more of these have to have happened, and the ones with asterisks, one of them has to be one of these. So you have to have delusions and grossly disorganized or catatonic behavior, or you have to have hallucinations and negative symptoms or you have to have disorganized speech and negative symptoms, or you have to have delusions and hallucinations, or you have to have hallucinations and disorganized speech. You see what I'm saying? So one of the, one of the asterisks has to be present. You know, when you think of schizophrenia, I, I don't know if you have any uh, experience with somebody with schizophrenia or anything like that, but um, when people commonly think of schizophrenia, they think of delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, maybe catatonia. So we've already talked about delusions and hallucinations and what those are. Disorganized speech is when 
it, it appears that someone can form words correctly, so it's not like a, a learning disability where, where someone can't get out uh, the, proper, the proper words, although it can appear that way. You know, what you're going to see a lot of times with disorganized speech is someone um, that rambles a lot, and then the words are, they sound like real words, but they're not put together in the proper order. So it's, it's going to sound really strange when, when somebody's um, talking with disorganized speech. A lot of people describe it as um, uh, babble or, or just weird nonsense kind of words, you know, kind of like that. Then there's grossly disorganized or catatonic behavior. So you'll see a lot of muscle movement sometimes, you know, the inability to sit still or... Um, uh, a lot of times, especially when uh, schizophrenic, or when clients with schizophrenia are on medication, is you'll see twitching and, and uh, all sorts of things because schizophrenia affects your muscle movement. Or you'll see the exact opposite, which is catatonic behavior, which is basically sitting in one position or laying in one position and not really moving for hours and hours and hours. That's catatonic behavior. Almost like you're in a coma, except your eyes are open and you're breathing. And you look sort of like you're sitting resting, maybe. But you're not really reacting to the environment. That's catatonic behavior. And then there, and there's a list of negative symptoms that could be happening, right? So like the inability to express any kind of emotion. A lack of eye contact. Abolition is... Um, a psychological term for not being able to move your body. So like I said, when, when uh, kind of on the upper end of the spectrum of schizophrenia, you know, the more severe end of the spectrum of schizophrenia, there's a lot of muscle control and bodily control um, problems in clients. So the level of functioning in work, school, in caring for yourself, um, you'll a lot of times uh, clients will have a significant decrease in that. So before the onset of schizophrenia, or before they were uh, they got off their medication for schizophrenia, you'll see a real difference between what was before and then what is during the schizophrenic episode. And usually, you can see it in self care. So um, when my mom used to work for the Mental Health Corporation of Denver, and so I did a lot of volunteering um, for the Mental Health Corporation of Denver when I was your guys' age, when I was, you know, 17, you know, 16, 17, that kind of, that kind of age. And uh, um, I met four or five clients with schizophrenia, um, and, you know, they were working in the offices, and I would work in the offices, or, you know, we were doing volunteer work together, that sort of thing. And... Um, um, there was, you could, I could tell almost instantly when they were off their medication. They would, they would come in like disheveled and their appearance would just indicate that they hadn't bathed that, or showered. They hadn't brushed their teeth. They hadn't combed their hair. They um, were wearing the same clothes for a week. You know, it's that sort of self-care stuff that's, that's pretty obvious and striking. And then there are symptoms which have lasted for six months, like I was saying before. You know, if it's, if it's a shorter amount of time, it's going to be schizoaffective disorder, but, um, you know, so within the six months, if you had a one-month period of delusions, or at least one-month period of delusions, then you would qualify for schizophrenia. Um, the symptoms can't be because of drugs or medical conditions, obviously. We talk about that a lot. There's no history of autism or communication disorders. Um... The grossly disorganized catatonic behavior and the negative symptoms, disorganized speech even, it kind of mirrors autism. So that's something that a mental health professional has to rule out before he or she can diagnose this. And the disorder seems to be a mix of um, a bunch of stuff we've talked about before, you know, anxiety, um, mood disorders. But it's with this added bonus of Deficit in reality testing. That's what makes this psychotic. Right? 
that person cannot distinguish between reality and fantasy. Let's talk about some treatments. Um, with schizophrenia, there there are medications because what you're trying to do is um, is reduce the power of these kinds of symptoms, right? Of the delusions, the hallucinations, the disorganized speech. So you're prescribing them to limit hallucinations and the delusions. And a lot of times they're a mix between antipsychotics, antidepressants, and anti-anxiety medication. So it's kind of a, a cocktail of medications. And it's really it's really difficult for for obvious reasons, you know, when you're prescribing these kinds of drugs. Um, to get drugs at a level that the person can handle, you know, there's going to be tons of side effects. You know, the the we'll talk about the cycle of medication here in a little bit, but um, you know, it's it's really tough to get the right mix correct. So luckily, schizophrenia is pretty rare, but we try and get the mental health professionals try and get the medications as in the right doses as possible. And the National Institute of Mental Health reported that three quarters of all clients stopped taking their medications, mostly because of the side effects. You know, imagine taking three or four different, you know, pretty heavy kinds of, you know, that, that drugs that really, you know, um, go to work on your brain. So it's going to have some serious side effects. And the other thing is, um, that not all the medications stop the hallucinations and delusions right off the bat. So it might take a month or so to work its way through your system and, and, and start really working. It might um, require a different dosage or different medication. So there's a lot of, you know, we're going to try things out and see how they work. And a lot of clients who have schizophrenia stop taking the medications because they're tired of dealing with the side effects if it doesn't stop the symptoms. And of course there's psychotherapy. Um, people don't just get uh, psychotherapy kind of as a rule with schizophrenia. They have to pair it with medications to reduce the delusions and hallucinations. Um, but therapy can help um, a person like uh, with the self-care aspect of schizophrenia with um, dealing with social situations because there's going to be a lot of anxiety if you're a client with schizophrenia because you have a hard time figuring out what's real and what's not real, right? So just think about think about that, right? Not knowing what's real or not real. And then having to, um, you know, go into like a public situation, you know, where a lot of people feel anxiety anyway, you know, public speech or, you know, going to a party where you don't know anybody, you know, that feeling of anxiety is just going to grow and grow and grow, right? So psychotherapy can help that. Um, it can also help make sure the client is taking medications. Obviously, with all the side effects and all the trial and error sort of things with medications, it's going to be important that the person, you know, sticks through that for reasons I'll tell you about in a bit. And then um, it can help with coping skills because, you know, you're going to need... Uh, as a client with schizophrenia, you're going to need some um, strategies for dealing with times when, you know, is this real or is this not real? When you, when you believe that. And one of the most effective parts of psychotherapy is doing individual, doing group, and then including the family. You know, being a family member of someone with schizophrenia is really tough because the person oftentimes can't tell reality from fantasy. So um, the, there are times when the person may not recognize a family member. There are times when a person may actively um, try and uh, yell or scream or run away or hide or hurt a family member because they think that that person is, you know, they're in a hallucination or a delusion and they think that the person is there to hurt them or do something to them, right? So it's really tough being a family member of a schizophrenic. So Therapy as a family unit is really important, and it's shown really great um, gains in terms of um, helping people out uh, and helping people stay on their medications and helping clients with schizophrenia um, reintegrate back into their families after they have episodes. So it's really important just to educate the family 
and then to get everybody on the same page with regard to the illness. Okay, so let's talk about side effects from the medication because this is really important. Um, some mild side effects, which you know they can last a few weeks and they're annoying, um, are things like dry mouth, constipation, drowsiness, that sort of thing. Some more serious ones, which last longer, sometimes the entire time you're taking it, are lack of muscle control, tremors, a lot of people shake like they have Parkinson's, um, muscle cramps and spasms, um, some long-term side effects are facial tics, like a lot of licking of lips or thrusting or rolling of the tongue, there's panting, there's grimacing all the time, you know, um, and so those could last forever as well. And so you can see here that, you know, even with the annoying ones, you're going to be dealing with these for the entire time you're, you're alive and, and, and on these medications, if you're taking medications all the time. Um, and then when they get into the more serious ones, you know, um, it, it would give you even more anxiety going into a social situation or dealing with people, right? If you have a facial tick all the time or if you don't have control of your muscles and you don't feel like you're in control of your body, you know? So clients with schizophrenia, they um, oftentimes don't take their medication, which leads to this. So let's start here, right? Symptoms are the hallucinations and the delusions, they're abating. They're going away because you're on your medication. And so then you decide, you know what, I really don't like these side effects. So since my symptoms are gone, I'm, I might be cured. So I'm going to not take my medication. And then because I'm not taking my medication, the hallucinations and delusions return. And because it's difficult for me to tell if I if what I'm seeing is real or not real. It's hard for me to tell when the hallucinations and delusions return. Then, because I'm having hallucinations or delusions, there's some sort of incident occurs where I get in trouble with the police, or I threaten a family member, I, um, I, I am scared or something like that in a, in a store or public area, and so you know I, I lash out or run away or do something strange where people end up calling the cops. And then I end up in the hospital where they medicate me. And once I'm on my medication for a while, the symptoms abate. And then I start to think, hey, maybe I'm cured. And then I start not taking my medications. Then the hallucinations return. Then an incident occurs. Then I go back to the hospital or jail or something like that for medication. And then the symptoms abate. Do you see how this works? And so, like I said before, with my volunteer service, um, you know, I met um, quite a few people. Uh, with schizophrenia, I want to say five, maybe six. I guess my mom here. So see, because I didn't know their diagnosis um, um, necessarily, so uh, I could tell sometimes based off of their behavior what their diagnosis, you know, could be or their their series of diagnoses that it could be. You know, their family. Um, and I would see clients going through this cycle you know, in the couple years that I was volunteering there. That's really because the medications are just so serious and the, the symptoms end up, you know, going away after a while. So you think, oh, hey, you know, I'm doing better. All right, so that is a brief sort of introduction to schizophrenia. A lot of people ask what the name schizophrenia means. And you see how it's, it's spelled? It's a German word. And the German word means split mind. So as you can see here, you know, the Germans uh, came up with this word because a person can't tell as a split mind over whether uh, things are real or things are fantasy. Right? So part of the person's mind can deal with reality, and part of the person's mind is caught up in delusions or hallucinations. And so that is what you need to know about schizophrenia. So everybody have a great week out there. Let me know uh, when you have questions so that I can help answer them. Um, and remember, like, in general, you know, when you hear the word psychotic or psychosis, um, 
what that means is a person is experiencing symptoms of delusions or hallucinations, typically. And that's what psychosis means. It doesn't necessarily mean something scary. I know a lot of people out there are going to think that, you know, psychotic means that, you know, the person's running around murdering everybody, but that is not the case. Most schizophrenics are so scared about what's happening that they're not going to hurt anybody. That does happen sometimes. That does happen sometimes. But for the most part, um, you know, a, a schizophrenic isn't going to run at you and try and hurt you. They're going to run from you because they're scared. You know, that's kind of usually how it works. All right, guys. So have a great week, like I said before, and uh, let me know when you have questions or uh, concerns about uh, any of the assignments or schizophrenia in general. All right, everybody. Take care.